Hi and welcome back to Oncology for Medical Students. This section of videos is on cancer diagnosis, beginning with the clinical features of cancers. What I'd like to cover in this video is essentially the mechanisms by which cancers make people unwell. In other words, what effects do they have on the body and what signs and symptoms do they produce? Tumours are essentially parasites and they don't serve a purpose to their host. All tumours, benign or malignant, can cause problems. Broadly speaking, cancers cause problems via these mechanisms. Local effects, systemic effects to the wider body, rupture, hormone production, ulceration, bleeding and infection. I'll go through each one of these with some examples. The first example is local effects. As tumours grow, they can press on local structures and cause organs around them to stop working properly. One example of this is the biliary system. So in this diagram, we can see the liver at the top, the gallbladder just underneath the liver, the bile ducts, and then the pancreas at the bottom. So the normal function of the biliary system is to drain bile, which is produced by the liver. The normal function of bile is in emulsifying fats, which is basically changing their structure so that they're able to be digested and then, and then absorbed. Bile also serves another function, and that's in the excretion of something called bilirubin. Bilirubin is a product of the breakdown of blood cells, and basically, um, the liver puts this into the bile and excretes it into the, the gut. As we can see here, the bile's draining from the liver through the bile ducts and then into the gut. However, if a tumour grows in the head of the pancreas, the part of the pancreas where the bile ducts run through, the drainage system gets blocked. bile doesn't make its way into the intestine and eventually the bile leaks back. This means that the, the bilirubin which would normally be excreted in the bile builds up in the blood. When you have high levels of bilirubin in the blood it then deposits in the skin and the eyes and causes jaundice. Cancers aren't the only cause of jaundice. Any condition that affects drainage of bile through the bile ducts and many diseases that affect the liver have the potential to cause jaundice as well. But most of these also cause some element of inflammation and have associated pain. In the case of tumours, however, there often isn't that much inflammation and pain often isn't a big feature. This means that Having a, a painless jaundice is often quite an ominous sign and is usually related to a cancer of the head of the pancreas or the bile ducts, which is known as cholangiocarcinoma. The next mechanism I want to talk about is hormone production. All cancers, especially those that arise from glandular tissue, have the potential to produce hormones. These hormones can travel around the body and have various effects. A good example of this is the production of parathyroid hormone related protein or PTHRP, which is commonly associated with certain types of lung cancer. If you know anything about calcium metabolism, you'd have heard of something called parathyroid hormone. This is a hormone that's normally released in relation to low levels of calcium. Parathyroid hormone works on the bones, the gut and the kidneys in order to raise the level of calcium in the blood to a normal level. When it's released by cancers, however, the level of uh, calcium in the blood is often normal to start with and it isn't releasing the hormone in response to any kind of detected levels of calcium. What this means is that it 
leads to high levels of calcium in the blood. A good way of remembering the symptoms of high calcium in the blood is this rhyme. Stones, bones, groans, thrones, and psychiatric overtones. Stones relates to the development of kidney and gallstones. Bones, bone pain. Groans is abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Thrones relates to something called polyuria, which is passing lots of water. And psychiatric overtones relates to depression, cognitive problems and insomnia, which are all symptoms of high calcium. So PTHRP isn't the only hormone that is released by cancers. There are lots of other examples, which we'll cover in later videos. The next example is ulceration, bleeding and infection. As tumours grow, they invade tissues local to them. And this might mean invading blood vessels and causing bleeding, or causing openings that allow bacteria to travel to parts of the body where they wouldn't normally be able to get and cause infection. So some examples of this might include um, something called hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood as a result of lung tumours. Another example might be um, passing blood in the, the stool or in bowel motions. If you have a tumour that's causing bleeding in the lower parts of the gut, you might get fresh blood passing. But if you get um, a tumour in higher parts of the gut, the blood might get digested as it moves down. And this forms something called melina, which is digested blood, which has a, a very thick black appearance. One thing that's worth mentioning at this point is something called microcytic anemia. So basically, if you have chronic blood loss over a long period of time, as you might with this kind of bleeding, the body tries to compensate by making more and more blood cells but it often ends up pushing these blood cells, out, blood cells out before they mature. So if you look at the blood, for, for a start you have high, uh, low levels of haemoglobin, which is um, anemia, but also the blood cells tend to be quite small. In young women who are premenopausal, microcytic anemia is quite common because they have bleeding um, around the periods. But postmenopausal women and in men, microcytic anemia can be quite a worrying sign because it might mean there's a bleed somewhere in the body that just hasn't been detected yet. The next example is rupture. As tumours grow bigger and bigger, they can become more and more unstable and they can burst and rupture through to part other parts of the body. An example of this it might be a bowel tumour rupturing through to the peritoneal cavity. This can cause a severe type of infection called peritonitis. Other problems might include rupturing large blood vessels leading to um, a lot of blood loss. The last thing I wanted to mention are systemic effects, which are effects around the wider body. The first thing in this category to mention is cachexia, which is a loss of body fat and muscle tissue. It's not necessarily caused by the increased nutritional demands of the tumour, as a lot of people might think, but it's actually more likely to be related to the release of hormones and cytokines produced by the tumour and by the host in response to the tumour. Anorexia is also very common in patients with cancer, even if their um, cancer isn't affecting, directly affecting their gut. But reduced intake doesn't completely explain this weight loss. What we do notice in people with cancer is that they have an increased basal metabolic rate, which means their whole body con um, consumes energy at a faster rate. 
Cachexia isn't the same as starvation. In starvation, fat tends to disappear before muscle, and the basal metabolic rate decreases. In cachexia, fat and muscle tissue disappear at the same rate. Experiments suggest that this might be related to um, a cytokine called tumor necrosis factor. Lastly, in terms of systemic effects, it's worth mentioning these things called paraneoplastic syndromes. Paraneoplastic syndromes are basically collections of symptoms that um, a result of uh, a cancer but not related to the local effects of a tumour. So some of the things we mentioned before in terms of hormone release actually apply to this as well. Some examples of this are Cushing syndrome which is a release of um, a hormone called ATCH, SIADH which is caused by a release of an uh, antidiuretic hormone, hypercalcemia as we mentioned before and neuropathies so nerve problems related to cancers. I won't go into an awful lot of detail about these now I'll do a, a video later on and we'll talk much more about neoplastic syndromes in the future. So just to finish I thought I'd mention the two-week rule criteria. So the two-week rule criteria are a list of signs and symptoms that should really alert GPs into suspecting that there might be an underlying cancer in a patient. If they see any of these signs and symptoms, they should refer the patient to the relevant specialty and they should be seen within two weeks. So if we look closely at the two-week rule criteria, we can see some examples of the symptoms that we've been talking about in this video. For a start with the lung cancer section, we can see that hemoptysis is obviously very high up on the list, which is coughing up blood. We can also see that um, fatigue, shortness of breath and weight loss are mentioned. For esophageal cancers, dysphagia or a difficulty swallowing could be a sign of a tumour blocking the food pipe. And for pancreatic cancers, we can see that jaundice is high up the list, as we explained earlier. So to summarise, cancers can cause illness by local invasion or impingement on local structures, hormone secretion, ulceration, bleeding, infection, cachexia and paraneoplastic processes. Thanks for listening. If you found the video useful, please click the subscribe button and check out the other videos on the channel. Thank you.